Good morning online if you're tuning in with us. You guys get extra bonus points this morning for being out in the air that hurts your skin when you go outside in it. I don't, I, it is not in God's will that I live in a place that gets this cold. I'm confident of it, but... I'm glad we're here to worship together. We're glad you made it. Um, we're glad you're tuning in with us. We want to start by singing together, lifting our voices. So will you stand with us? Come are you weary. Come are you thirsty. Come to the never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more oh come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness and find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Oh, Jesus is waiting there with open arms. open. We have our arms open. We're glad you're here. We want you to feel welcome here at Westview Community Church. There is a connect card at the bottom of the worship guide you got on your way in. The best part about that is that we want to know you are here. We want to um, know you better and we want to answer any questions you have about 
um, this church and how you can get plugged in. So please fill that out if you would. Uh, there's a welcome booth right outside in the lobby that would love to get that from you in person, but if you're not comfortable with that, we have boxes at each exit. You can drop those cards in as you leave today. Um, looking at that worship guide is going to tell you some other stuff that's, that's coming up, and all of that can be seen on our app as well. But the thing I'll call to your attention is we have a new small group starting for moms, and that's happening this Thursday morning here at Westview Community Church. Please spread the word if you know a, a military mom, a stay-at-home mom, a foster mom, a work-from-home mom, whatever that looks like for you. If you're free on Thursday mornings, we'd love for you to come and bring your kiddos. We have fun activities for them as well. So pay attention to that. Share that with those moms you know. And beyond that, let's continue in worship this morning. Count on one thing I'm the same God that never failed and I fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out working all things
you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be your holy name. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us, Lord, as we forgive. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as in heaven. Let your glory come, shining like the sun. Your Into temptation, into temptation, deliver us from, deliver us from the evil one. Remind our hearts, our hearts that you're always with you're us. Always with us. We, we shall never be afraid.
come on, sing it like you mean it. It is the word. Forever your kingdom reign. Yes, for thine is the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom. Yes. The power and the glory. Yes. Praise. Amen. Would you continue with us in this time of prayer? You can be seated. You can come to the steps if you want to pray at the altar. We just want to continue um, in agreement and in community to come before the Lord and pray the way that he taught us to pray, to call upon his name. Who can speak after that? In uh, prayer this morning, I discovered that this psalm, if you don't have much time, takes two minutes. Listen to the words that God speaks. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day or of the pestilence that stalks you in the darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked, for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and they will bear you up in their hands that you would not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. God says, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name, Yahweh. He will call upon me. And I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. And I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, we have come today in the mighty name of Jesus by the power of your Holy Spirit. We wait upon your hand. God, lead us in prayer as we call to mind those who you have placed on our heart, we lift them up to you, knowing your promises, knowing your words to be true. We stand upon the promises. They're all yes and amen. Father, we are your children. We are the reward of your suffering. And we thank you for hearing us as we lift each one to you. And we watch eagerly for your answer. To you be all the glory forever. 
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Would you all do me a favor? I think it's kind of an overdue thing, but would you give a round of applause to all of our worship team and our people? I get to every week follow them, right? So it's a good thing. There's the people up in the booth, but we, from the bottom of our hearts, they work really hard every week to bring us into uh, the presence of God as a church, and uh, I'm very thankful, as I know you are too. I am fascinated by the heart. And for those of you maybe newer to Westview, I, uh, I'm a late bloomer as a pastor. Just been a pastor a few years. I uh, actually was kind of a late bloomer even as a Christian. I spent 25 years in healthcare. Some of my healthcare friends are right here in the audience. I was a paramedic for many years. And when I was studying as a paramedic, I ran into a topic I absolutely loved. Cardiology. Cardiology was an amazing class. I come to love the heart, the study of the heart. So let me go all nerd for just a minute. Can I do that? I love the fact it's four chambers, one big muscle sitting here right off the left side of our sternal wall right here. And it's, that's how big it is in you. If you make a fist, that's how big your heart is. Whether you're a kid or a child or adult, it's right here. And I just, I loved uh, everything from the sinoatrial node to the atrioventricular node to Purkinje fibers to the pathophysiology of the heart to the electric physiology of the heart it was so exciting and then I got to treat patients and I, I, I know it sounds terrible I loved cardiac patients because I got the ability to see what was going on and make a difference and not only that I got to teach it over the years as I understood it I came to teach EKG courses at the health system I began to teach electrophysiology uh, how the heart conduction so, you know this is a cool thing can I share this with you I didn't share this first service electrophysiology the heart has its own conduction system not dependent on anything else so when you you watch those horror movies and somebody reaches in and rips their heart out and it still beats it can really do that <laughs> didn't know if you thought that was as cool as, as I did <laughs> I taught resuscitation classes not only adult but pediatric and neonatal I just I loved it and I taught for over two decades about the heart I love the heart I eat healthy I try to take care of mine as best I can so I hope you understand my shock when I learned this week that I have a heart condition. And I found this out in one of the most unexpected places, in God's Word. And I found out something else when I was looking at this heart condition that I have is I found out I'm not alone. Every person in this room, no matter what age you are, you have a heart condition too. Our hearts are sick. You know what our prognosis is? It's fatal. But I don't want you to get all bummed out about this. I want you to take a breath because today we're going to talk about there is a treatment for your heart condition and mine. There is a cure, and I want to assure you it is 100% effective. I want you to take a bigger breath because two thirds of the world outside these doors will not seek that cure and I hope today's message changes all of our hearts in a big way and changes our hearts towards others too who don't know the cure I want to welcome everybody here we're glad to see all of you to our guests my name is Brian and uh, when you walk through the door uh, Lene, I'm sorry, I didn't listen earlier. <laughs> Did we cover the Connect card a little bit? Just let me reiterate to our guests, we love having you here. If you're online with us or you're here in person, we would love uh, for you to kill, just fill out this Connect card and drop it off in a box here or drop it off our Welcome Center. Those of you who are online would love to know you're with us so we can connect with you and uh, share with you and get to know you. Um, we're looking at this new sermon series called Matters of the Heart, and today's title is Heart of the Matter. The month of February is Heart Month, right? Guys, Valentine's Day, week away. But we talk a lot about the hearts. We thought, you know, when we, Lene and I are talking about this, is like, I don't know if there's a sermon over the last year that you've heard where I haven't talked about change here, change in my heart. But we've never gone deep. We've never gone deep to talk about this thing that the Bible talks about in the heart. 
So we felt it was a good time to have us all spend about four weeks examining our hearts, go deep, go deep together, look at the diagnosis, look at the cure, and look at our recovery plan. For Christians, there's this diagnosis. For us who believe in Christ, there's this diagnosis I think that's very common to all of us. It's our first sermon note together. Our diagnosis is this, big brains and a sick heart. This is a common Christian diagnosis, big brains, sick hearts. I've got some medical people here, so just verify with me. The medical term would be cerebral edema and cardiomyopathy, right? Swelling of the brain and a diseased heart. For Christians, a struggle that we have is the day we came to Christ is like it was a big day. But then what happens is after that day, we might stop. And what happens is our mind gets bigger. We, we go to life groups and we learn about God and our, and our brain begins to swell with all this information of who Jesus is and who God is, who the Holy Spirit is, but it never changes here. It never changes in our hearts. Big brains, sick hearts. And what happens when you have this diagnosis is that you look like a Christian on the outside, but inside there's this disease process going on. There's a remarkable story of a person with this diagnosis, big brain, sick heart, in the Old, in the Old Testament of the Bible. It's in the book called 1 Samuel. It goes way back to when the Israelite nation first formed. And there's this guy who's the book's named after Samuel, who's a prophet, a great man of God, who speaks God's heart to the people of Israel. To kind of catch you up, the people uh, of Israel, the Jewish people were rescued out of Egypt. They come through the desert over that long period of time. They land in this nation of Israel so God can say, you are my chosen people to show the world who I am through you. And so it's just starting to rock along and all of a sudden, the Israelites say, well, we need a king we need a king. Everybody else around us has a king. And God says, well, I'm your king. You don't need a king, but they want a king. So God relents and says, okay, I'm going to warn you. But what happens when you put a man in control? And so he goes to Samuel's prophet and he says, I'm going to appoint a king through you. And Samuel does. And the man chosen to be the first king of Israel is Saul. Now Saul, the Bible describes him, he's tall. He's, it says he's a head above everybody else and he's handsome. Good looking dude, right? Who you want to be a king? Tall and handsome. He's 30 years old when he becomes the first king of Israel. He reigns for 42 years. And it starts out good. God blesses him. He's got a lot of neighbors who are their enemies. So there's a lot of military campaigns. There's a lot of people that come against the Israelites and God gives him victory and God gives him blessing and the nation starts out okay. But over time, over time, Saul's brain swells and his heart gets sick. What happens is Saul starts listening to himself. He, he sees these battles and God said, this is how you go battle them and, and Saul changes it and thinks his way is better and, he, and, he, and, and all of a sudden some of the military campaigns fail and the same thing with the nation. Sometimes God, God says, hey, do it this way but Saul says, you know, I think I'm gonna do it this way. He follows his own rhythm. It gets so bad. His brain gets so big his heart gets so diseased that one day Saul in the town of Carmel builds a monument to himself. And then God in 1 Samuel says this. He says, I'm sorry that I ever made Saul king. And so God goes back to Samuel and says, we need to get another king. And so he sends Samuel to the town of Bethlehem. You know, we just sang about Bethlehem a lot over Christmas, right? Sends him to the house of Jesse. Jesse has all these sons. He says, Samuel, you'll find the next king there. It's one of Jesse's sons. So Samuel goes there. Jesse lines up his kids, oldest to youngest. And Samuel sees a first son. He says, this is God's anointed to lead Israel. And God tells him this. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by an outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. He looks at the heart. 
So Samuel looks at the firstborn, good-looking guy, handsome guy. Nope, that's not him. So he goes to the second one, looks at him, and then Samuel says, no, I don't get it with God here. He goes all the way down the pecking order of all of Jesse's sons, and none of them God puts on the heart to be the next king. And so he says, Jesse, is this all the sons you got? And he says, no, we got one more, but he's young. He's the youngest. He's out tending to the sheep. His name is David. Bring David here. Samuel sees Jess, or sorry, Samuel sees David, Jesse's son. But God sees David's heart. And he becomes the anointed one. Not only does David become the king of Israel, he becomes the best king Israel ever had. Even with all his faults and everything. And even, even David is described later in the New Testament in Acts. where he says, God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And that's how David is tagged, a man after God's own heart. David was selected because of his heart. So what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this scripture? And it's our second note here together. We tend to look at the outside, but God examines the heart. We tend to look at the outside of other people, but God examines heart. We tend to look at ourselves from the outside, ladies and gentlemen. I will, I will cut clear here. I put on a little bit of stuff under my eyes to cut the swelling down this morning just so I didn't look so tired. Amen. <laughs> we tend to look, I mean, think about this. When we, when, we, when we size somebody up the first time, we look at their, their looks, right? I mean, we spend a lot of time on our looks. We look at health, age. We look at skin color, nationality, the way they speak. We look at what do they do. It's one of our favorite questions. What do you do? That, that seems to define people for us. And then we look at their outward behavior. We look at their demeanor. And then we make an assessment out of that or a judgment out of that. But do we really take time to pause and look at somebody's heart and try to know it first as God looks at us? Do we block our first thoughts, our preconceptions, our that stuff? And do we, do we desire to see deeper as soon as we can to understand somebody's heart? Why is the heart so important? Why are we going to do a four-week series on the heart? Why does the Bible have between 800 and 1,000 references to the heart? And our third sermon note explains why. The heart is the center of our desire, our will, and our feelings. The Bible describes our heart not as this four-chambered myocardium muscle with arteries and electrical conduction. It describes it symbolically. It describes it spiritually. It describes it as the center of our soul. If I could summarize everything that I read through in the Bible about the heart, I would say it says this. It says that the heart is the fountain of all streams that flow in and flow out of our very soul and our very spirituality. It is the fountain of every stream. You want to know what we desire most? Like what deep down we desire most? Look here, you'll find it. Do you want to know why my will is so weak or why my will is so stubborn? We'll find the answer here. Do you want to know why I'm struggling with my emotions, why I have trouble with my anger, whatever it is, the answer is here. The center of our soul and our spirit. And what's interesting is you, you dive into the Bible and you try to explain, well, what is the heart like? It's actually confusing, at, at least at first. And let me give you a list here of just four Bible references to explain out of hundreds that explain what the heart is like. Let me give you four here. The Bible describes the heart as first, it's bad. It's deceitful. It's sick. And it's mysterious. This is how Jeremiah 17, 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure, at least a cure that we have. Who can understand it? Sick, deceitful, mysterious. But then it turns around in Psalm 51 and says, It's good. It's pure. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Is the song coming up in your mind? And it's bad. We go to Mark 7. It's sinful. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from 
here, and they're what defile you. But then it's good. In Proverbs 4, verse 23, it's the very spring of life. Guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Life now, eternal life. From it flows salvation. So what is it? Is it, is it good or bad? And our next sermon note will help us with that. Whether a heart is good or bad depends on the rhythm. Whether a heart is good or bad depends on the rhythm. You know, when I was a paramedic, I remember the first time that we'd get there and we'd be doing the patient look like cardiac. First thing I do, put the heart monitor on. Put the heart monitor on to see what the rhythm is telling me. The rhythm tells me a lot about what's going on inside somebody. So let me kind of break this down to two categories. The first rhythm is the rhythm that we want. The first rhythm is the rhythm that we determine. And whenever we determine the rhythm of our heart, I can tell you it will always end up bad, eventually. There's this advice that goes around for us, and now many of us have said it. I confess I've said it. It says, follow your heart, right? That's somebody, who's got that advice before, right? Follow your heart. That's terrible advice. <laughs> Don't follow your heart. Why? Why? Because this is what we learn in the Bible is that we are born into a sinful world. We are born with a sinful nature. We're all born with a sick heart. If we follow it, it's going to take us eventually to places that will lead to deceit, sin, sickness, and ladies and gentlemen, death. Spiritual death. Physical death. So not our rhythm. Please, don't follow your heart. <laughs> but what if we don't follow our heart? Here's the other side. What if we don't follow our heart and instead let our heart be led by someone else? What if we don't follow our heart and take control? But what if we let somebody else lead our heart? What if we let somebody lead which sets a different rhythm? What if we let someone who knows our heart better than us, even better than that, what if we let someone lead our heart who created our heart, knows everything about it? Amen. What if we let someone lead our heart who came to fix it? Jesus is the only one who can change our rhythm and make bad hearts good. That's why we're Christians. We follow Christ, the one that knows our hearts, came and fixed them and changed them for good because he knew what was wrong with our hearts. Jesus is not interested in cleaning us up on the outside. Now let me, let me share this quote with you. We, it's been quoted by many people. We kind of formed it on our own. It says, Jesus isn't interested in behavior modification. He loves heart transformation. And let me explain the difference between the two. Behavior modification is an outside-in movement. Christians, we do this. You can go onto Amazon, go into any Christian bookstore, and get all kinds of books that tell you how to change your behavior. And we, a lot of times we start from the outside-in, and a lot of times that just is not very effective. It can be, but most of the time it only lasts for a while, and we're back to the same struggles and the same disease but Jesus loves completely changing our heart. He's into heart transformation. Here's your next sermon note. Jesus is our heart surgeon. He's a heart surgeon. Let me explain this. For lasting change in rhythm, we have to change from the inside out first. And there's one that can do that, and that's Jesus. He is our heart surgeon. You don't have this scripture verse in your reference, but write down, right next to that sermon note number five, write down Ezekiel 36, 26. I added this kind of late. Here's Ezekiel 36, 26. God predicted Jesus, the heart surgeon, when he wrote this in the Bible. It says, and I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you, and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and I will give you a tender, responsive heart. God accomplishes heart transplants through Jesus. Jesus says, I know what's wrong with your heart. Jesus says, I came to fix 
and cure what is wrong with your heart because what is wrong with our heart is sin. So how does Jesus do that? How does he heart transplant? How does it start? Instead of just looking at this and saying, okay. And let me jump into Romans 10, verse nine through 10. Here's where it starts. Here's where the surgeon goes to work. The scripture verse says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart, right back here, that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Jesus is a great surgeon because he came to earth and he relieved that burden of sin that so diseases our heart and he brought peace to our souls if we just believe and start with following him. To know that Jesus died, to know that Jesus died in my head is good information about history. To believe in my heart that Jesus died for me and for you is salvation. Do you see that difference? You can believe in him, and that's good history. I can know about him, but if I believe here who he is and that he died for me and his sin and disease is my heart, for me that is salvation. For you that is salvation. To openly declare that Jesus is Lord and leads our hearts and sets a rhythm of our hearts, that saves us and it makes us right with God. Jesus, our heart surgeon, first saves our hearts and once our heart is saved, the real work begins. And we see this in Ephesians chapter three, which is our scripture verse that we're gonna hang on today a little bit. It's our key scripture today. Once that surgeon starts, once I give him my life and I believe, and he swaps those hearts out, then he begins to work. Ephesians three sixteen through 18, it reads this. It says, and, and this is a prayer from Paul, an early church leader who is talking to a very young church about the importance of what's being said. But he's saying it in prayer form. This is a prayer. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand this as all God's people should. How wide? How long? How high? And how deep is his love for us? beautiful description of a heart given to Christ and then letting him set up in our heart to continue the work this is all done Jesus has risen to heaven but he's given us the Holy Spirit so he starts with this Paul says it starts with the power of the Spirit in us, which brings Jesus right into our hearts and you notice that he says he's making his home in your heart. It does not say Jesus is treating your heart like Motel 6 or that he's there for a camping trip. It says he has come to take up permanent residence if we let him. Open heart surgery that Jesus wants to perform once we let him in is not a single event. It is an everyday event. The surgeon works every day to keep out what shouldn't be coming in and to grow our hearts to be everything that God expects us and wants us to be. If we just trust him, if we just let him have that space is what the scripture says and let him go to work, we will see the change in us. We will see a change in how we live. We'll see a change in, I'm gonna talk about that change in just a minute. Don't let me run that over. But then that change will start to trust him in what he's doing. I'll trust him. 
to stay resident in my heart. And it says when we trust him and the surgeon is work every day, it says we will grow deeply rooted into God's love. He's getting rid of all that garbage and he's filling us with the very character of God through Christ and that is love. It fills us and it explains how much it fills us. It first talks about how wide. It says how wide God's love is. It can chase down you or me no matter where we're at. And not only can it chase us down and find us wherever we're at, once that love is in us, it can reach the world through us. That is how wide God's love is. But then it talks about how long. How long is God's love? When Jesus sets up residence as a surgeon in our heart, he is there for our entire lifetime. Oh, even more than that. He's there for eternity. That's how long his love is. He sets up and stays. And then it says, how high, how high is his love? It's like, ladies and gentlemen, when Christ takes over my heart, the joy and celebration in my life, and I don't care what's going on around me, changes. The joy I can experience, the celebration of life in me goes beyond anything I can imagine. And the last thing it talks about is how deep that love is. That love and that surgeon can reach the deepest, darkest issue the deepest, darkest depression, the anxiety, the sinful behavior, the worst event in our life, the most hopeless situation, it can reach, his love can reach that. It can even reach death and change it. Paul's prayer for us still our prayer today that Christ will set his home up in our hearts so I, I can leave you there but I, I, think th- I think we need to talk about well how do I know how do I know if Jesus is resident I mean I feel like I've given my life to him and, and I'm, I'm trying to get from here to here but how do I know he's resident in my heart how do I know he's there doing the work he's doing so let me give you a short list of indicators of open heart surgery. These are indicators in my life that he's at work all the time. These are ironclad ways to recognize I'm on a good, a good direction and a good rhythm. First, we've given things up, right? When he takes over, I'm giving up things in life that I used to think were important. And the word here is sacrifice. I'm cutting them out of my life. I'm cutting things out of my life that no longer have value and time that was worthlessly spent I carve it out it's surprising what we find out we don't need versus what we really need not only do we give things up and there's sacrifice we stay on the path we stay on the path that God has directed us to in Christ you guys know this we, we get off path sometimes right you know, right now we're looking at this COVID season, like 20% of our church we've lost track of. I'm not sure what path they're on. And we're fighting to find them all and bring them back. It's so easy to get off that path. I, I was sharing in the first service, I, I'm going through a, a master's degree right now, and, and I have a spiritual formation class that goes on to make sure I'm growing, I'm sure my heart is changing, my mind is expanding. And it, and it asked me this question about the path I'm on. So, and I said, I'm on the path. I feel like I'm on the path, but I feel like a drunk, like weaving on the path all the time. That's how I, draw, I, I described it as a drunken state. I'm on the path that God wants me, but I love to weave to the boundaries, right? I'm not really drunk. I'm just, it's metaphorical that it was. <laughs> but it is, I, I'm weaving a little bit. The medical word is a toxic. I'm a toxic. But I'm on the path. Here's the next one. Uh, We've given things up. Uh, We're on the path, which is submission. That's me submitting to God in his way. And Jesus, like, I'm gonna let you stay in that heart there. I'm gonna submit to this. The third is we have deep sorrow. We have deep sorrow. Well, what does this mean? Well, it used to be before I let Jesus take residence in my heart that I used to uh, be fearful of my sin. I used to be scared to death of the penalty when I screwed up. But now that Jesus is there, and I'm growing in relationship with him to God and in the Holy Spirit, I have deep sorrow every time I get off on the path because I see what it's doing to my relationship with not only Christ, I see what it's doing to my relationship with God, 
I see what it's doing to my relationship with the Holy Spirit, and I see what it's doing to my relationship with my brothers and sisters. The deep sorrow is a sign of relationship, so much that I repent, which means I turn from it so strongly because it hurts the ones I love. And that is a sign the surgeons at work. Last one. We are filled. We are filled. I'm satisfied. I'm content every day because the master of my heart and the work he's doing, and I'm just flat out content and happy. I wouldn't say that I don't still pursue things. Maybe I shouldn't, but I don't do it nearly as much. I spend a lot more time pursuing him. And to know this joy of being content, not really wound up about my mortgage, about my career, about, I'm wound up about the surgeon in my heart and what he's doing. Look at that list. Indicators that the king of my heart is at work each day. As I look around this audience, I know all of us are in different places on this journey. I know we're all in different places about heart change. Some of us may be struggling with cerebral edema, cardiomyopathy. We're inviting everyone in this series to examine our hearts together as, as a body, to examine our hearts together and over the next few weeks and allow the surgeon to work. Six years ago, because it seemed like that long, I left healthcare and became a pastor. And when, I, when I'm telling people about my story, I often get this question, why did you leave being a paramedic to be a pastor? And Kara's heard this answer many times. <laughs> She's just going to probably roll her eyes. <laughs> I said, because 100% of the people that I met and I took care of as a paramedic, I found out we're still going to die no matter what I did. 100% of the people that I took care of as a paramedic were still going to die. I chose a career where 100% of the people I encounter can get a heart that never dies. And guys, that does not take a pastor. It takes a Christian who loves Jesus to have that impact on everybody. And I want to remind you, two-thirds of our world out there is not looking for a cure. And we have a cure inside of us. We're really excited about the COVID vaccination, and we should be. But in us is a much bigger cure that the world needs. So I only gave you half of Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. To close us out, I'd like to recite together the rest of the prayer. There's a couple things I want you to be aware of in Ephesians chapter 3 as we wrap up here in verses 19 through 21 is there's a shift in the words. There's a shift from you, and I want us to feel this shift. There's a shift from you to we. It is so important what God does in our hearts through Christ, but it's more important that it, what it does is it brings us into the body of Christ and we are a force to change the world. And as we read this, I want us to pick up speed, not speed, I want us to pick up power. By the time we hit verse 21, we're yelling it out because of how true it is. You ready? Because this is the way Paul wrote this. It's not boring. It's really exciting. You ready? Okay. Let's do this together. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. That's how Paul wrote that verse. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I love your word more than I love the heart. I love how your word changes our hearts. Father, this offering time is we're going to give us the best offering that we've ever given you, and it starts with our heart. 
Father, for the next four weeks, I'm praying for our church that our hearts come alive and the surgeon is invited in and he does the work. Father, first I want to start with those who are online and those who are here in person. If I've never started that first step of believing in Jesus and letting him be the Lord of my heart, that that decision be made today. And if you're, if you're going to make that decision today, I can't think of a better day to do it. I want you to come up after the services. We'll be right up here in the front. Nobody's watching, nobody. And I want you to share with us. I want to make that decision today because that's what the body of Christ, the church, does as we walk with you. So, Father, don't let somebody leave here. Don't, you know, those folks online, you can write us a note. There's some stuff connected right there. Just say, would somebody walk with me? And we will. Because we want you to know this new heart. Father, the rest of our church, we just ask that we rise up and we let the surgeon get to work. And every day we're inviting him in. And every day we're carrying the cure. And every day in the world where we live, that we're sharing about the cure to others, one that's even bigger than COVID. Father, awaken your church. That's our offering. Anything else we give, Father, we give our finances to move the mission of this church and change people's lives. Father, we give our time and talents to grow the hearts of this church to go out and make a difference in the world. Father, let our offering be our heart and our best heart we can give. Father, bless each person in here. And through your son, the great surgeon, we pray all this in his name. And God's people said, amen. 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 So you'll see up on the slide, this is just a reminder, normally this would be our giving time, but we are not passing plates for obvious reasons. Uh, we just want you to know there's electronic ways you can give uh, online or through our church app. If you like to drop actual money somewhere, we have boxes near each exit. You can give that way. But those of you online, please use one of our electronic ways as well. Um, anyone else thankful for that message this morning? I can't, I, get, <laughs> I can only speak for myself, but as I sat there recounting um, all of the times that God has changed my heart, uh, all of the evidence that he's been at work in my heart, and then I saw that summary list of uh, particularly sacrifice, the things I've given up, like unforgiveness and, and anger and hurt um, about things in the past, and then to also see in myself recognize the deep sorrow and the repentance for ways that I used to think and ways I used to behave. And so anyway, I hope you guys also saw that. He mentioned we're gonna dive deep in the next few weeks. And honestly, I don't know whether to be excited about that or scared because <laughs> I've had lots of surgeries, six on my knees alone. The surgeries are hard, they hurt. So anyway, I'm a little nervous about what's to come, but I think it's gonna be good, amen? Stand with us. We're going to close with this song when we were talking in Scripture about the story of King David um, and being a man after God's own heart. That's what this worship song is about, that we would all be men and women chasing after God's heart. The sun is rising, your mercies are new, you're already chasing with relentless pursuit, you have my attention, you have my whole life, I don't want to miss you here. So open my eyes I'm after your heart And all that you are The treasure I find To know what you're like I'm after your heart So do what you have to Won't you break down the door I want to know you like never before. Oh, won't you do what you have to? Won't you break down the doors? Because I want to know you like never before. I'm after your heart and all.
Christians. Leave as men and women after God's own heart. Have a good week. We'll see you next Sunday.